We welcome you to worship at Brunswick Street Baptist Church on the second Sunday of Advent. Thanks, Scott and Tara Kennedy, for your opening uh, songs of worship today. And uh, we're so glad that you're with us. We apologize for being a little late, uh, but through the uh, brilliance of our technical director, Anthony Brown, we're here today. And uh, so we're grateful to share this time with you. As the service unfolds today, we're thinking about uh, comforting Christmas traditions and uh, today thinking about carols as a comforting Christmas tradition. In that light, then, let's hear a carol perhaps from the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. For every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all humankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. With those words of comfort and thrilling words of assurance, Let's consider uh, our Advent video today. One tradition I enjoy during Advent is singing Christmas carols. It's a joyful experience for me to sing with our church family. And in our family, when our children were young and growing, we had large family gathers with friends and family on Christmas Eve. We would uh, have our Christmas dinner on Christmas Eve, then we would go to church, and then we would have dessert. And at the very end of the evening, we would have a very enthusiastic carol sing. It's a wonderful thing to sing Christmas carols that express the truth of God's Word. I'm glad that uh, a topic for Sandra and I is Christmas carols. Um, they're very special to us, and, uh, and they do put us in the festive a festive mode for the season. Um, and one thing I like about Christmas carols is that they, they are still sung in public. Uh, we sing them in our churches. We sing them in our homes. But we hear them being sung in malls and stores and concert halls. And so... Even though the, the words might not be thought of uh, uh, by everybody too seriously, the words are there, and uh, they're there for those who have ears to hear. And the gospel message is there, and the, and the message about Jesus and about hope and peace and joy are there in the Christmas carols. My mother taught me the very first one, Away in a Manger. I remember that so well. And then in grade one, the very first solo that I, Christmas solo that I remember singing, was, I was asked in grade one at a school concert. And the song, it was a, not a real familiar one. It's called, There's a Song in the Air. There's a star in the sky. And the last sort of line of that is, for the manger of Bethlehem cradles a king. So I learned early on that Jesus was born in a manger, that he was important because he was a king, even if I didn't understand all the, the importance of it at the time. And then in college, I was introduced in a 
real strong way of to Handel's Messiah. And what a joy it was to learn those songs and to sing the God's Word straight from the Bible. And it was a great joy to have all those practices and then to be able to present it uh, with uh, a choir. And then there's O Holy Night. We hear every year and think about it. Choir anthems that are so meaningful to me. And then the silent night that often ends our services. It expresses great desire for peace in our hearts and in the world. A more a recently composed song uh, speaks powerful to me in the last two or three years. It makes me meditate and think about God, about Jesus and his role in our life. Mary, did you know? I'll just quote the last few little uh, lines. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know? that your baby boy will one day rule the nations. Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? This sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. What makes a carol a favorite for me is the words that are in the carol and, and how close the words fit uh, the gospel or the words of the Bible and joy to the world starts out joy to the world the Lord is come let earth receive her king so a lot of the carols talk about Jesus coming as a king and he told Pilate he said he agreed that he was is a king but his kingdom is not of this world. In joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive its king. Let, let every heart prepare him room. So the message is that every heart needs to prepare room for Jesus. Um, the heart represents the very center of our being. And so... This is the place where Jesus wants to live, right in the very center of our being. And um, so I like that message. It's uh, joy to the world, a beautiful message of hope for the world. Christmas carols we sing truly point us to our Lord Savior, Christ Jesus. The words in the carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, remind us that Jesus brings light and life to all. This carol also tells us that Jesus laid his glory by, leaving heaven to come to earth, for Jesus was born that man no more may die. In John 11, Verses 25, 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. So today we relight the first candle in the Advent wreath, reminding us that Jesus is the light of the world, illuminating the way to God. And now we light the second candle, letting the world know that Jesus 
the newborn king, the everlasting Lord, came to be the Lord of our heart. Will you make room in your heart for him? Let's pray. Dear Father, we are thankful for the truth of scripture that we sing in the Christmas carols, that you sent your son Jesus into the world because you love us and want a relationship with us. We know we can have a deep relationship with you when we make room in our heart and invite Jesus in to be our Savior and Lord of our lives. We praise you for your love, for your mercy, and for your Son, Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful day that we are able to gather here virtually. Um, Thank you for the the wisdom and the knowledge and just how we have developed technology to be able to gather in this way is such a gift in this very challenging time. 
Uh, God, I just ask that you would bless us this morning and open our ears and our hearts to what you are speaking to us through um, through Dr. Bodner and through Greg and through all this music and all our messages this morning. Thank you for your people and thank you for Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. Now, boys and girls, we are going to focus our attention on our children's message this morning. We have Joy and Jisoo who will be teaching teaching us about how to wait. Okay, Jisoo, I'll be back in 15 minutes. If you can wait for me, we can have this donut together, okay? Okay, okay. I'll be back I got it. 15 minutes. If you can wait for me, we can have this donut together, okay? Okay, I got it. Whoa, Jisoo, you waited for me? You promised me that you'll come back, so I waited. That was Whoa, so Jisoo, hard. You waited for me? That 15 minutes felt like two hours. So Whoa, I'm so impressed, that was so but hard. I can't believe you did it, though. That 15... I'm very happy that you trusted my promise. You know, this reminds me of a story in the Bible. It's Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 35. It's about a guy named Simon who patiently waited to see God's promise of salvation. Simon was over 200 years old when God's promise finally came true. The Holy Spirit visited and told him that he wouldn't die until he had seen the Lord Christ. Imagine how long that must have felt for old Simon. So God kept Simon's promise? Yeah, exactly. God did not forget about him and he kept his promises. We can always trust God when we are waiting for his promise. Jisoo, what kind of things can you wait for for 200 years? Hmm. What do you think, pig? You got one? Okay. Oh! He said a mega life-size Pokemon card. Whoa, that sounds super exciting. You know, I don't think I can ever wait 200 years. I can barely wait two hours, especially when it comes to that delicious donut there. Is there anything else you can think of that God promised us, Jisoo? Oh, that we'd have unlimited cakes in heaven? <laughs> now that would be nice, but, but not quite. What else? It's the second coming of Jesus. God promised us that when it's the right time, he'll send us Jesus. No one knows when that time will be, but in the meantime, why don't we wait with patience and excitement and faith and spread God's love with others? And his word. Can we just know it's been 15 minutes? Yeah, I'm all right. I had to, too. I want to thank Joy and Jesu for their message this morning, and I do hope you got to eat that donut. I think that's a long time to wait and uh, have to hold on that donut, so I hope that, uh, Jesu, you enjoyed that. Scott and Tara are going to uh, lead us in a meditation, and then Dr. Bodner will be with us by the magic of uh, technology. Grateful to our friends at First Baptist in Moncton for uh, arranging the recording of his sermon. Uh, he's missed being here in the uh, times that uh, we've been separated by the orange phase, uh, but has been in touch uh, regularly and interested in what's happening here and uh, looks forward to connecting with us in the future. So Scott and Tara, if you'd lead us, please.
Well, open up your Bible, if you don't mind, to Luke chapter 2, because there's an intriguing episode just after the birth of our Lord Jesus that's going to form the basis of our Advent reflection today. And guess what you're going to hear? You're going to hear a Christmas carol right in this very passage that we're going to study. And it's a Christmas carol that I don't think you've heard on the radio or on Spotify or on MySpace at least none of the typical venues, but you're going to hear it in a moment right here. So don't turn the dial, just turn instead to Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. And even while you're finding that passage, you're immediately going to feel at ease because you know a lot about Luke already. We've been highlighting for quite some time at the street that the book of Acts is addressed to a friend of Luke's, and his name is Theophilus. This carefully researched book is designed to give this Greek friend an introduction to the gospel. The story of God's kingdom, a new community where walls of hostility and mistrust and racial and national prejudice are dismantled as the announcement of the good news about the arrival of the Messiah radiates from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Some people find it helpful to imagine the gospel of Luke as a sort of prequel to the book of Acts and in this gospel, Theophilus, the outsider, here's a story about a God who literally came down to rescue us, to set us free and to invite us to participate in an entirely new journey of life. That's what Pastor Greg stressed last week. Our lives matter and what we do every day has meaning as a result of the gospel story, of which Advent is a crucial moment. You'll have noticed by now that our episode in Luke chapter 2 takes place in the great temple of Jerusalem. The temple that was supposed to be modeled on the tabernacle in the wilderness. When the Israelites were brought up out of slavery in Egypt, God directed them to build a place of worship. This place of worship was portable because God moves and isn't restricted to one particular locale. And it's designed to be at the center of our lives as a constant testimony that God is accessible and that our entire life can be absorbed in the character of God who created us and who cares for us. Among the various furnishings of the tabernacle, you'll find a table and a lampstand. The Israelites are instructed to always have bread set on this table, signifying God's provision and hospitality. And it's probably this image that inspired the poet in the famous Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies reminding later generations that God might not pull us up out of miserable circumstances as we prefer, but will always be with us in the midst of any trial. Similarly, there's a lampstand in the tabernacle, a menorah with seven branches, just like a tree of life. And the Israelites are given careful instructions to always keep enough oil on hand that it might continually be ablaze, this lampstand, in order to signify the ever ready presence of God always on hand to illuminate and to guide our path. The prologue to John's Gospel has this radiant lampstand tradition in mind when announcing that in the fullness of time, the true light that gives light to everyone is now coming into the world. This is the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness will never, ever conquer it. Well, it should be clear by now that the Jerusalem temple furnishes us with a host of Advent themes, underscoring the story of how God pitches a tent and dwells among us. And it's here, in the same temple that evokes all of these memories and all of this potential, that Joseph and Mary arrive in Luke chapter 2 to dedicate their firstborn to the Lord just as the law requires. So it's in the context of ordinary, run-of-the-mill, straightforward obedience that these new parents have a most astonishing prophetic encounter. So let's listen, verses 25 to 35, Luke chapter two, where we discover that there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to undertake for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon then took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, 
which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Hey, did you manage to catch that Christmas carol right in the middle of the passage? It may not have a catchy tune like Jingle Bells or a seasonal invitation like, come on, it's lovely weather for a sleigh ride together with you. But it does have something better. In fact, what commentators refer to as the Song of Simeon has a certain X factor. And I'm gonna tell you what that is in just a moment. First though, who is Simeon? This is the only time he appears in the Bible, and he's given permission to hold the baby. From what I've noticed, parents can be quite protective of your firstborn. You ask, aw, can I hold your baby? Well, it depends. They look at you skeptically, and they want to know, what are your credentials? After that, like years later, as offspring begin to multiply, that same question, can I hold your baby? takes on a whole new meaning. Oh yes, they say, some years down the road, here's the stroller and the diaper bag. I'll see you in four hours. I'm gonna have a nap, get a spray tan, and I'm gonna go get something to eat at a place that doesn't have a play area. It's remarkable then that Simeon is given, given permission to hold the firstborn, and he must therefore have impressive credentials. Indeed, Luke tells us, and he's crystal clear, that Simeon is righteous and devout, and he'd been looking for or waiting for the consolation of Israel. What does that mean? Now, it's theologically weighty, but it's really simple at heart. If you're waiting for the consolation of Israel, it means that you believe something. You believe that one day, on a massive scale, God will set in motion a new era when everything that's broken will be repaired. Everything that's lost will be recovered. Every injustice corrected. Every wound healed. And be honest with me. When do you need consolation? Well, usually it's after some sort of disappointment, isn't it? Even the shortest survey of Israel's history reveals ample disappointments for God's people. And surely at the top of the list is when they're banished from the land of promise and exiled far away to Babylon. And here's why. They trusted in the wrong things and they ended up in the wrong place. Have you ever known anyone who's had that experience? Has that ever happened to you? Well, it happened to God's people. They trusted in the wrong things and they ended up in the wrong place. But God promised not to abandon them to their own misery, but instead declared that at some point, an entirely new time period would be inaugurated, when we'd no longer be subject to the whim of cruel oppressors, and no longer be fractured by internal corruption and leadership that falls woefully short. Instead, we'd be guided by a true shepherd, a son of David, the branch of Jesse, who would reign with equity, and with a strength greater than anything that's been known before. Waiting for the consolation of Israel is believing that such an era doesn't come from the world, but it only comes from God's initiative, and that's worth singing about. In BTW, Isaiah the prophet did sing about this very expectation centuries earlier, forecasting a day in Isaiah chapter 52 when such an announcement is made. And Isaiah envisions how beautiful on the mountains will be the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who carry tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they'll see it with their own eyes. So break forth together into singing, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He's redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will show forth his holy arm in the sight of all nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the victory of God. And this is the essence, the essence of what Simeon believes. 
And he's residing, don't forget, of all places, in first century Jerusalem, a hotbed of factions, self-righteous know-it-alls running around spouting off their opinions. If you think your world is messed up, you try living in this city under Roman occupation. So all credit to Simeon for not losing focus in the midst of mayhem. When you're righteous and devout and waiting for the consolation of Israel, it means you're willing to believe that God's promises mean more than any kind of present political circumstances. It means that you live in the midst of hope that God's purposes are going to come to pass even if the world says there's no chance of that happening. And it also means that you have faith in God's faithfulness over and above any degree of stressful turmoil that rages in or around you. And this is why Simeon's Christmas Carol, proclaimed while he's holding the Prince of Peace, the incarnate word who can't yet speak a word, this is why the Song of Simeon ought to be in your playlist this season. Scroll back to those lyrics for a second. Do you remember what they say? Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you can now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Hey, did you catch those three different X factors in this song? First, here in the precincts of the Jerusalem temple, Simeon's lyrics stress the advent of salvation. And this means rescue from our disasters, preoccupations, folly. It also means victory over all that assails us. And this is why, just a couple of verses earlier in Luke 2.21, this child is given the name Jesus. Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, which means the Lord is salvation, front-loaded in the Christmas carol of Simeon. Second, the song emphasizes the dawning of light for revelation. Now, the Greek word here is apocalypse, and that means unveiling. So this is a light for revelation or unveiling to the Gentiles. So this is a unique kind of light that shows outsiders the way, and it's an incomparable Christmas truth. The light now shines in the darkness, and you can be assured that the darkness will never triumph over it. Third, this song signals that the glory of Israel is at hand, the crowning glory in a long sequence of promises to the people of God about an heir to Jerusalem's throne, as guaranteed to the very line of David itself. So the privilege of sharing the good news about the birth of the long-promised son of David throughout the earth is surely both an honor and a consolation as well. And it ends this Song of Simeon on a high note. In fact, Hollywood screenwriters might recommend that this episode end right now on this happy note of the Christmas Carol. Just end the episode here and start roasting chestnuts on an open fire with social distancing. I mean, for sure, you recall that Simeon's last words don't actually seem all that comforting. He actually sounds like a, like a bit of a downer when he says to the parents, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and, to Mary, a sword will pierce your own soul as well. On the one hand, even a basic familiarity with the life of Mary reveals that this will be very true indeed. A sword of great sorrow will pierce through bone and marrow with the family's desperate flight to Egypt, the rejection of her son and national misunderstanding, the trauma of the Stations of the Cross, culminating with her firstborn crucified. So, a sword will pierce her soul. On the other hand, we wonder as well if Simeon's closing words aren't meant for a, lot, a larger audience at the same time, especially the idea of the falling and the rising of many. See, for some interpreters, Simeon becomes a crucial voice used by the author of the Gospel to express a tension in the world regarding the scope of God's salvation and of human resistance. Maybe the notion that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed is a potent reminder about our own darkness or cynicism or even resistance to the entrance of God's word, like a sword of the spirit 
that slices apart our pretensions. Pastor Ken Hughes remarks that the Messiah's arrival reveals what our inner lives are really like. Human goodness is seen as filthy rags. Unable or unwilling to handle the truth, we naturally oppose, he says, Christ's work. But when we fall before him in humiliation, we receive grace and new life. Jesus always knocks us down only so that he can pick us up. Well, if that's the case, then maybe Simeon's last words are not a downer at all, but rather a challenge to each of us to make sure that we fall down before the Messiah this Advent season, for when we do, he promises to lift us high. My eyes, said Simeon, have seen your salvation, not part of it, not something cute or sentimental or therapeutic, Rather, Simeon's eyes have seen the author and the finisher of our faith. And I think we should finish, therefore, by suggesting that there's a compelling case to add the Song of Simeon here in Luke chapter 2 to your all-time favorite Christmas carol playlist. After all, the author of this song held in his very hands the Prince of Peace. As T.S. Eliot put it, the still unspeaking and unspoken word, and that's more impressive than any resume I've seen lately, I'll tell you that. Well, as for Simeon, he seems content to end his songwriting career as a one-hit wonder, and tells the Lord that he's ready to be dismissed after years of waiting. He's ready to die because he's found what's worth living for. Let's pause and let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word, and for an episode that inspires us to have ears to hear and eyes to see how you've been at work in our lives, even in the midst of our darkness, our unfaithfulness, and in our desperation as you've chosen to visit us and to invite us today to new life with our Savior, the risen Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray this Advent season. Amen. Amen. Our Savior, the risen Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray this Advent season. Amen. I promise that we'll get Dr. Bodner back on his medication for uh, next week, and uh, hopefully that will help with the, the bouncing back and forth, but uh, we're grateful for the message today. As Dr. Bodner was talking about uh, Simeon's carol and the, the seriousness of the carol, I've asked uh, Talia, and she's going to be accompanied by Elaine, to sing a Christmas carol today that, uh, that I certainly love. But it's a Christmas carol that often is, uh, has verses excised from it. It's a Christmas carol called, What Child Is This? And the, the chorus usually for each verse is um, lost to me right now. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud or praise, the babe, the son of Mary. But in the original text that the hymn writer wrote, there's this foreshadowing of the cost of our salvation, this sword that is going to pierce, uh, pierce Mary's heart. And I, I'm going to ask him to sing it now and to uh, lead us to consider that the babe of Bethlehem does not stay the babe of Bethlehem, but grows to be the Lord of Calvary and the coming again king. And that's why we're excited about his coming this season. <laughs>
Thank you, Talia and uh, Elaine. And uh, just in a moment, we'll be joining our, our in-resident uh, missionary servant to India, John Stewart, um, who will be sharing about this year's beneficiary for our Going Global campaign. And uh, this is a place that has become just very dear uh, to John's heart, as I'm sure he'll, he'll uh, share that with you. Um, but the beneficiary will be, in particular, uh, the women, children, and youth of the Mycene, Mycene tribe in uh, northern India. And uh, just how wonderful is it that we can um, be the hands and feet of Jesus to bring the good news uh, to to this people, to the, this community, um, and we can share in the grace that has been given to us, uh, and share in the giving and uh, the administering of the gospel uh, to a place that's on the other side of the globe. Uh, that's pretty amazing. So we are grateful uh, as a church um, and as servants of Christ to be able to do that. Um, so before we go to that uh, video. Uh, please join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege um, to be able to share your gospel, your good news with people, and uh, to bring the knowledge of salvation to others, whether it be near or whether it be far. And uh, today we come to you uh, in a difficult and strange time, Lord, but we are blessed here in this province and in this church uh, where we are still able to um, give in your name and to serve uh, so that other people may come to know about you. And so we just pray a continued blessing uh, on this people and we pray a continued blessing on the body of Christ here at Brunswick Street. Uh, we also lift up uh, other places who are um, being hit hard right now with the pandemic. We lift up those who are uh, the frontline workers, in particular nurses and doctors and people who uh, in many walks and many uh, uh, jobs that place themselves in harm's way. Uh, we just pray for protection and a downsizing, a downturn of, of what's going on in our world. But overall, Lord, you are God and you are above it all and uh, you are not plagued by uh, COVID-19. And you continue to work through us, and we are just privileged that we are able to continue to serve uh, you and to uh, exalt your name high. And so that's, that's what we do today, Lord. We lift you up, and we pray over all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning. I want to share with you about the going global component of Brunswick Street's initiative to provide a positive impact on the global community. This year, Brunswick Street is focusing on an ongoing project taking place in Assam, India, called the Missing Tribal Project, a project which focuses on women and children. And I want to encourage you to be generous in your giving to support this project. In this way, we become participants in responding to the needs of others with expressions of God's love in the form of resources for them to enhance their personal and vocational development. An old adage that I'm sure you're all familiar with is, if you, fish, give, if you give a person a fish, he or she will eat for a day. But if you teach a person how to fish, he or she will eat for a lifetime. Today, to describe the outcome of teaching skills, we might use words like com capacity building, skills to accomplish a task, self-sufficiency, using skills to earn a living, and sustainability, skills that will last a lifetime. The Missing Tribal Project focuses on community development by focusing on three groups, women, children, youth, and young adults. The focus on women, women accents the teaching and production of clothing using traditional weaving methods and producing traditional patterns. The focus on youth and young adults and children is an education focus. Children, youth, and young adults will receive an education that is designed to improve their literacy levels, enabling them to access skill trades 
or college education, depending on their interests and abilities. One of the problems for the missing tribe who live in this area of Assam is the annual flooding of the Brahmaputra River and other rivers. The land is flat, and when you fly over the area, you can easily see the high water mark left from flooding. The flooding damages crops <coughs> and as well as houses, making for shortages of food and shelter for families. The money raised during this initiative will provide mothers with raw materials for weaving and knitting shawls and other pieces of clothing, reproducing their traditional cultural patterns to sell. The money from the sale of such goods enable them to buy food, to pay for medical fees, and school expenses for their children. Additionally, the money will go to help 60 children from five villages by providing a quality education and hopefully soon to establish a school in the region. Further, the money will provide training for computer, in computer use and other tactical and vocational skills that will enhance the opportunity of these youth and young adults to secure employment or operate small businesses. All three of these groups from the missing tribe will benefit from the money raised to develop skills that can last a lifetime to produce things and provide services that will enable them to gain self-sufficiency and sustainability. I want to close this presentation with a brief quote from Bijona, a young woman from the missing tribe, tribe, and how this ongoing project helped her. She writes, since in my village I know how to stitch clothes, my villagers do not travel distances for that purpose. I'm happy that I can help my people. I, would, I could not do anything due to poverty, but thanks to the project now I am relieved that I have a livelihood and a future. I have also built a strong belief that God's love and grace is the same everywhere. I want to leave you with this admonition from James, one of Jesus' disciples. He writes, if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go to, in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet do not supply their bodily needs, what is, <coughs> is the good of that? So faith by itself, <clears throat> if, it is, if it has no works, is dead. I would encourage you to exercise your faith by supporting this project. And I would leave you with two more quotes from the scriptures. First in Corinthians, God loves a cheerful giver. And in Proverbs, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him or her for their deeds. May God richly bless you for your generosity. Thank you. As we close the service today, just to highlight the starting local and going global projects, we're grateful for the giving that has uh, taken place thus far. There's still time to give. You can uh, mark your starting local project uh, gift, just starting local, and that will go to support families here in Fredericton that are connected with uh, our church family and uh, going global to support the project that John has uh, just spoken of uh, in India. I want to remind our kids and parents that uh, each week on Wednesday there's a, a new edition, Christmas edition of our BFF Kids Club uh, that drops on, on Wednesdays on our website and uh, you can uh, tune in for that and enjoy that time together. We're planning a Christmas party, a virtual Christmas party at this point for uh, next Saturday, December the 12th at 2 p.m. And I uh, hope that you'll join us, all ages. Our puppets will be here, and uh, we'll have a 35 or so uh, minute program to share together just to celebrate the season uh, and enjoy time together and uh, to uh, just be together in a virtual way. Now, if the province converts to the yellow uh, phase in this week, as has been rumored, then uh, there may be changes to that in terms of uh, in-person attendance, but you can find that out by tuning into our newsletter uh, on the street online.ca uh, Wednesday of this week. And then this evening, to remind you that our Hanging of the Green service will be uh, up this evening, uh, and you can enjoy that service. There were about uh, 50 folks who took part uh, yesterday in recording this service, and uh, they were happy to do that for you, and we hope that you'll enjoy it. As we conclude today, let's just bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of Christmas. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you that he came to raise the lowly and to lower the high. 
And Father, we thank you that uh, his plan is for us to enjoy relationship with him in a way that gives us hope and peace and uh, comfort in the midst of difficult times. So thank you that Emmanuel means that you are with us. And so we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the indwelling of your spirit, and for the privilege of being able to serve you in this week to come. And may you be pleased with our offerings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.